Believers often ask me, if evolution is true, then why do we even care about morals, laws, or each other? And there are at least two problems with this. One is it depends on the false dichotomy fallacy, that we either have to accept the sacred scriptures as completely and literally true, or we have to reject God in order to accept science. That's the very first foundational falsehood of creationism, and I'll do another video about that for the Pratt List series real soon. The other problem is the embedded question of where atheists get their morals from, as if believers have an objective moral standard and unbelievers don't. There's a lot wrong with that, too, especially when they clarify that their morality depends on fear of punishment. And many Christians have told me that if it weren't for belief in their God, they'd run amok, raping and killing and vandalizing everything, because why not? Well, if that's the way you feel, then why didn't famous atheists like Carl Sagan or Christopher Hitchens act like that? Even Jack Nicholson and Bruce Lee didn't act like that. And maybe they could have gotten away with it. This leads me to think that if you think that some omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent punisher is the only thing stopping you from being the most immoral monster you can be, then you're an immoral monster already. But we know even that's not true, because we've seen numerous people who've given their lives to God in one form or another, becoming ministers and missionaries and so on. Yet after many years of that, some of them have realized they can no longer believe the nonsense they're selling from the pulpit. So they join a support group of hundreds of others like them called the Clergy Project. And what they've shown again and again is that losing their religious beliefs actually made them more tolerant, more compassionate and curious. So losing your fear of God can actually make you more moral and even less violent. But if you're still a God-fearing person, say a Christian, for example, and you think your God is going to punish you for doing evil, no. Your Bible says otherwise. It says it doesn't matter how evil you are. All sins will be forgiven if you but believe. But if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter how good you are. Because the only sin that will not be forgiven is the sin of disbelief. All your good works are like filthy rags. You are saved by faith, and that means believing impossible absurdities for no good reason. Thus, gullibility is the sole criteria for redemption. Morality isn't even a factor in your judgment, because you're not really going to be judged, of course. And seriously, how immoral is it that a God would punish people not for what they do, but for what they believe? Your God has questionable judgment. If God were real, he wouldn't care if you believed in him, and it'd be his fault if you didn't. So you're not going to go to hell if you don't. It's the people who want to impose and reinforce their delusion and then use that to control you, who promise a posthumous paradise they'll never have to produce, and who threaten you with a fate worse than death if you're not credulous enough to swallow that first lie. In reality, the only thing in the universe that needs or wants your faith is a bad liar. Real things neither desire nor require faith and continue to exist regardless without it. And defenders of the faith really want to pretend that they have an objective moral standard. They want to believe their morals were decreed by God. But even if they imagine their God to be the ultimate authority, what is or isn't moral comes down to his opinion and his alone, which makes it a subjective standard. Objective means that it's not influenced by personal feelings or opinions. So if you want to make sure you're right about something, you wouldn't ask yourself, of course. Nor should you ask the God who lives inside you, who hates everything you do for the same reasons that you do, and who, who can never explain anything to you that you didn't already know about or understand. Your personal God is limited to your knowledge and opinions because he is you. That's why other people's personal relationship with your God gives them different answers than your God gives you. Praying to your God is just going to get another subjective answer because it's coming from the same person, you. And that answer is entirely dependent on your personal feelings about it. So you should ask other people for their opinions because they might be informed opinions. And even if they're not, they're still not based on your own perspective personally. They are a different person, and that counts for objective verification. Hey, does anybody else see the ghost of Colonel Sanders in here? No? Just me? Okay. Better yet, you should look at what the data actually shows, regardless how you or anyone else may feel about that. That would be objective, too. Now, how do we know what is moral or immoral? For whatever reason, most religions seem to have a severe issue with anything having to do with sex, and sometimes just pleasure of any kind. 
but they keep making excuses to justify animal cruelty, war, torture and capital punishment, rape, murder, genocide, slavery, misogyny, child abuse, and molestation. And most of us realize that these are immoral, regardless of religious excuses. It doesn't matter if we're talking about Judeo-Christian, Muslim, or Hindu scriptures either. They all do that. So we probably don't want to trust the clergy or the sacred ravings on matters of real consequence in people's lives. If we can't decide objectively what is moral and what isn't, then we can't even make sense of this topic because it's literally meaningless. How can we pretend to have an objective standard if we can't even come up with an objective definition that we can verify to be correct? Because that which is consistent with the ways of God obviously doesn't cut it, regardless which holy book you're reading. There is a descriptive moral relativism between individuals because people are different. And the same goes for religion, who often contradict each other, even though most of them claim to be the divinely inspired word of what is in essence the same God. So if any of them were right, there couldn't be this disparity. But despite that, there's also a general trend or tendency among groups of people, not just one society, but all of them collectively, regardless of their culture or religion, that uninvited lies and violence are always immoral and should only be employed in desperate moments of self-defense, but that sex, music, and other forms of enjoyment are not always necessarily immoral, no matter how good or bad they make you feel. So morality then, is determined by what Christians would call the golden rule and witches would call the reed, which is to say, as Scott Clifton so cleverly put it, a particular action or choice is moral or right if it somehow promotes happiness, well-being, or health, or if it somehow minimizes unnecessary harm or suffering or both. A particular action or choice is immoral or wrong if it somehow diminishes happiness, well-being, or health, or if it somehow causes unnecessary harm or suffering or both. Now that we know what morality is, we finally have a standard by which we can measure our gods, doctrines, and religious leaders to see if they're moral, and they're usually not. But why does that matter if there's no afterlife, where we're trapped with an inescapable, indomitable, telekinetic telepath who will judge and punish us when we eventually, inevitably think of something we weren't allowed to think? That's just a matter of time, and we have all time. If only heaven didn't last forever and ever and ever. Why would atheists have morality? For the preservation of the one life we really do have and for the perpetuation of the community on which our lives depend. We evolved as social animals. Any animal raised in dependence by its mother is more capable of feeling compassion for another. And population mechanics of social animals provides powerful selective pressure toward altruism. This was explained in Dawkins' The Selfish Gene, which I'll tell you is a deceptive title. There are deviations from that, of course, because mutations occur randomly. Some folks have underdeveloped prefrontal lobes or inoperative mirror neurons, or their religious upbringing may have instilled a lot of unnecessary bigotry and hatred. Killing the infidel, on the word of one or two witnesses, is a strong selective pressure too, and that's how religion got to be so big. But people still awaken from that mindset, and they can recover from it. In the early history of our genus, we had already lost the extra muscle and huge teeth of chimpanzees and gorillas before we grew our enormous brains and achieved our state-of-the-art intellect. So there was a time when we were dumb and weak individually. But our inherent compassion for family, friends, and fellows prompted us to band together and unite for the common good, to have every one of us save any one of us who got into trouble. That was the key to our success. Then we got big brains. This is the foundation of humanity. This is where everyone gets their morals from, including those who want to pretend that they're holier than thou because their morals were imposed from on high. But their obvious and often criminal hypocrisy shows that no, their morality doesn't come from any benevolent deity. Certainly not an infallible one. This is what happens when you pretend to be something you're not. Our moral standard is inherent in our nature. We all behave as we do, good or bad, because we're just a bunch of arrogant fucking monkeys trying to get by the best we can. And the best way is to help each other do and be better.